Hey, my name is Drew Stevenson. I'm the lead pastor here at Redemption Church, and I want to say thank you so much for tuning into our live stream. We do a live stream each week for two reasons. One is so that if you're out of town or unable to make it to our church service, so that you can participate in worship and sit under the teaching of God's Word. But the second reason is for those of you who had never been to our church before and you're just checking it out, we want to take this opportunity to invite you to come to one of our services. And that's because we believe that church is not just a service to watch, but it's a family to be a part of. So I would love to personally shake your hand, look you in the eye, give you a hug, and welcome you into this church family. Good morning, Redemption Church. Would you guys stand with us as we sing? Sing my mind. the spirit felt the love of the father found my life in the savior and it changed me forever i've encountered the goodness felt the truth in the power oh i've been saved by jesus and i will praise him forever My heart to you I bring My hope it holds on to see That your spirit would move in me That your presence would pull me deep I've encountered the spirit Felt the love of the Father, found my life in the Savior, and it changed me forever. I've encountered the goodness, felt the truth and the power. Oh, I've been saved by Jesus, and I will praise Him forever. Spirit 
felt the love of the Father, found my life in the Savior, and He changed me forever. I've encountered the goodness, felt the truth and the power. Oh, I've been saved by Jesus, and I will praise Him forever. 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 Your voice is no weapon. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. So Lord, just lead me. Lead me. Good morning, Redemption Church. My name is Nate. I'm one of the worship leaders here. We want to take a second, make this big room feel a little bit smaller. So why don't you take a moment and meet somebody around you? Good morning. Good morning. Go ahead and grab a seat. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, my name is Travis. I'm on staff here. Uh, if you haven't met me yet, I'd love to shake your hand and introduce myself. So come find me after service or anyone else that has a staff lanyard. We would love to get to know you. Um, this morning, guys, we just have one announcement, and it's a, an exciting announcement. It's a building update, and I feel like I need to preface every building update with, is it a good building update or a bad building update? Because we have had announcements that have fluctuated from $30,000 grant that we received from the government to we found a tunnel underneath our building. And so this morning is an exciting building update. Um, we have been making lots of progress uh, on the building in the last month or so. Um, ever since we found the tunnel and figured out the solution to solve that problem, uh, we've been hitting it hard and there's a lot of work getting done. So we've got some photos to share. Um, we'll wait till, yeah. So this is drywall. I don't know if you guys have ever seen drywall. Uh, that, what you're looking at right there is one of the vestibules to go into the auditorium. And so the auditorium itself is about um, halfway framed out and drywalled. And so uh, they're working to get everything drywalled and framed out. The offices are currently drywalled. The bathrooms are all in. There's another photo. Um, that's looking in towards the offices. Uh, there's two doors there and then the bathrooms to the left. And so a lot of work's getting done on the drywall and the framing. And then you can keep going to the next one. This was uh, the tunnel repair job that was going on. So um, part of the tunnel that was underneath the stage is completely done now. And so they've covered that back up and then they are now beginning to work on the kids mezzanine area and repairing uh, the tunnel over there. So you can keep, 
going to the next picture. This is the uh, tech booth, so this is Corn's Castle, as we're calling it. Um, we've got, uh, yeah, everything framed in there. We're gonna start pouring concrete soon, um, and pretty soon that'll be coming together and looking like a tech booth. And then uh, this last picture is really exciting. The blocks that you see there is actually the beginning of the stage getting put in. And so um, we've got the whole back wall done, and we're starting to block in the stage itself. And so within the next month or so, it's gonna really start to look like a church building. And we're really excited to continue to give you guys updates. Um, Kind of on the same note as that, uh, if you have pledges that are outstanding towards the building, we have a member meeting coming up this next week, and um, we would love to be able to present uh, updated numbers on where we're at with finances. And we've got a lot of critical decisions um, in the next month or so with the building. And so right now we've got 130,000 still outstanding in pledges. And what we found out is that as a church, we can accept pledges, but our contractor and our bank actually just want the cash. They don't want the pledge. And so uh, if you can work on getting those um, in within the next week or so, that would be super helpful. And at this point, clarity is more helpful than optimism. And so if something has changed in your life, we get it. We're not trying to um, guilt you into giving more than you can. Just let us know if that number has been uh, changed so that we can update and plan accordingly. So, like I mentioned, um, we have a member meeting this coming Sunday uh, evening, and so there'll be more information um, for church members. At that point, we'll kind of walk through where we've been and where we're at right now, but we are currently on track to get into the building this fall still. So, it's really exciting. Um, like I said, we're going to continue to keep you guys updated as we get closer and closer to getting in. So, that was the, all we got today for announcements, so let me pray, and we'll get back into worship. Jesus, uh, thank you for everything that you have given to us and are continuing to provide for us. Um, I think about the verse that says that your mercies are new every morning and that gives us great hope whether we had a really good week or a really hard week this week. God, that every single morning you're gonna meet us and you're gonna show us grace and you're gonna love us and um, it's not reliant on our performance or how many times we read our Bible or if we snapped at our kids or anything like that, Lord, but it's based off of your grace and your love. And so would you just remind us this morning, Lord, that um, it is better to spend a day with you than a thousand elsewhere. Would our hearts uh, just remember and um, be glad knowing that you're accessible to us and that um, you are so much greater and so much higher than we can ever imagine and that your mercies are new for us every single day. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. I'll invite you guys to stand as we continue in worship. We're going to sing a new song this morning. Uh, I think it's fitting. We're going to spend time in Psalm 19. And part of what Psalm 19 says is that the law of the Lord is sweeter than the honey that drips from the honeycomb. So we're going to sing a new song this morning that's really fitting. People are excited about it. That's great. So sing it if you know it. But here we go. I know a good i 
satisfied, I'm satisfied, this is good. From the mountain to the valley, He is good. On my best days and worst ones, He is good. And from glory to glory, You're sweeter than the honey from the honeycomb. He's sweeter. He's sweeter than the honey from the honeycomb. You taste and see that he is sweeter than the honey from the honeycomb. My God, sweeter than the honey from the honeycomb. Taste and see. Sweeter than the honey from the honeycomb. My God is sweeter. Sweeter than the honey from the honeycomb. Taste and see that He is sweeter than the honey from the honeycomb. the sweetest name I've ever known. Taste and see that he is. Jesus is the sweetest name everyone. My name is Grace Cisna. Uh, my husband Austin and I lead a connection group on Wednesday nights in St. Paul. Our reading for today is Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the ends of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. 
The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. All right, so we caught David on a good day, which is nice. We've been going through some psalms that have had some heaviness to them, and we all need to know that the psalmists are human, that they're people that we can relate to, but we also need to know that they have genuine experience with God. David was described as a man after God's own heart. And what we're going to see this morning is he is looking out at God's creation and he is looking at God's word and he is worshiping God. And in seeing him do that, we are going to see that it's possible for us to get out of the funk that we're in and have a similar experience. Now, I think a lot of us think that that type of experience is distant from us, that it's not possible, that we can't really know God because he hasn't revealed himself enough for us to taste and see that he's good. Did you know that in Romans, Paul writes to us that it's not only possible to know God, it's actually obvious that he exists. In Romans 1, verse 20, Paul says that his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they, that's us and all of humanity, are without excuse. So in that one verse, we have this combination. Paul is explaining the purpose of creation through the word, and he is showing us what creation is all about. Both the word and the world are meant to reflect to us the glory of God and create in us worship as they reveal the heart of God to us. So that's what we're going to see in Psalm 19, that God's world and word reveal his heart. So first we're going to look at God's world as David celebrates it in front of us. So look with me again at verses 1 through 6. He says, The heavens declare the glory of God, And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. So David is looking up at the heavens. Now, he's not thinking about heaven, in other words, the afterlife. He's thinking about the heavens, the stars. And so you can imagine David standing out in his arid desert climate, There's no artificial light anywhere. And he's looking up into the sky. And he's seeing the stars in all of their glory and beauty. And he's saying, I can't stop with just saying the stars are beautiful. Or this is amazing, which all of us have done. He's saying, my praise is not complete until I see 
in the stars a greater glory. And he's recognizing that the heavens, the stars, are saying something greater than, look at me, look at me. They are saying, look at God. Because God created the heavens and the earth with a word. It wasn't hard for him to do that. And the expanse of the sky is meant for us to say, not this, but the creator of this. And so he's saying, the heavens declare the glory of God. It's obvious. It takes effort on our part to suppress that knowledge. It is as natural to us as breathing to recognize that and acknowledge the maker of the stars. So he says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. That word handiwork, it means his undertaking, his enterprise, his work, his labor, his achievement, his product, his act. And so he is seeing God as the grand actor in all of the universe. He is an artist. And the sky is his canvas. And he is recognizing that God is brilliant and amazing and that is pouring forth in praise and that praise is finding its expression in a song and again he's saying that this all reflects the glory or the majesty of God now the word that's used here for glory is the word kabod and that word kabod means heaviness. It's God's weight. He's saying, when I look up at the stars, I see the weightiness of God. I see his importance. I see that I am not at the center of the universe, and my heart is not meant to look in the mirror and to praise myself, but my heart is meant to look up to him and to see that he is the only one who can satisfy the desires of my soul. It's to see that God is the amazing one. God is the celebrity. God is the one who is meant to be praised. And is not by getting likes or getting attention or becoming famous that my heart is going to sing, but it is by seeing that I am not meant to be the center of the universe, but God is the center of the universe, that my heart is satisfied. He's showing us a different path to satisfaction. It is not by looking in or getting people to love us, but it is by seeing the majesty of God that our hearts begin to sing. And David is inviting us into that experience. He's saying to us, listen, you don't have to be great to be happy. You have to open your eyes and see that God is the one who is great. He wants us to have that experience. I think that what I see around me in the world is that people are starved for glory. All right, I said uh, people in this, in this world were are glory starved, and I'm seeing that everywhere around me. And I was reminded of that a couple weeks ago, I was in Washington, D.C. with my son Luke, and we went to the National Gallery of Art. And I had never seen some of the most famous artists in the world paintings in person. And there's something amazing, right, about standing in front of a painting, for example, for me, that was painted by Monet, and just looking at it, and, and what your mind begins to do in that moment is your mind goes beyond what you're seeing in the painting to the brilliance of the artist. And you begin to think, what type of person is it that could paint something this beautiful or this brilliant? And I looked it up, and I, I found out that I'm not the only one who 
enjoys that sort of thing. In fact, 1.7 million people a year go through the National Gallery of Art. And think about this for a second. Okay, most of the things in the National Gallery of Art are paintings of things that God has made. So here's how glory starved we are, right? We will go into a museum and look at an artist's rendition of something that God has made, a tree, and we're like, wow, that is a really amazing painting of a tree. Isn't Monet so beautiful? But we fail to stand outside of the National Gallery of Art and look at a tree and say, that artist is so much better. We were made to recognize the glory of God in his creation. And maybe as the weather turns, the simple application for us of this message is just to get outside and look. You know, I began when I was in college to do something that's a little weird, but has been awesome for me. Sometimes I will just go and lay under a tree for an hour or two. Have you ever done this? Just look at the branches. Just look at the leaves. Look at the intricate details in just one single tree and think about the maker of that tree. The marks of God's glory are everywhere. And he wasn't wasting space on the expanse of the universe. It was put there in part for you and I to delight in. And David is calling us into that experience. The second place that he calls us to look, to see the weight or the heaviness or the glory of God is not just in God's world, but in God's word. He says this, starting in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. So David is outside, he's looking at the stars, and he has his Bible opened in a surprising place, in a place that we would not expect to find the glory of God, the rules, the law of God. Some of you, when I say that, you immediately start to shrink back and you have bad church hurt memories. I'm just like, oh no. Don't talk about rules. Don't talk about laws. I'm so fed up with those things. And David is looking at the rules, the precepts, the commandments, the laws, and he is seeing in those things the same thing he saw in the stars. He's seeing the brilliance of God. Now, I think part of that is because David had a unique perspective. He was the king. And His job, in a sense, was to make just laws for the nation that he was governing, the nation that he was leading. And so I think that he's looking at the law from a little bit different perspective, not a standard that he could never live up to, but the law of a king who was brilliant in every way. And I think what he's doing is he's basically looking at the Ten Commandments. Worship God alone. Don't worship idols. Don't use God's name as a cuss word. 
Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Rest one day a week. Do not covet. Do not lie. Do not steal. Honor your parents. And he's kind of doing this thought experiment. He's imagining if in his kingdom, every single person obeyed those laws all the time. Imagine if we lived in a world where no one ever stole. Where no one ever murdered. No one ever lied. No one ever even wanted anything that anyone else had. There's no such thing as adultery. That is sex outside of marriage between one man and one woman, which means there's no rape. There's never an abortion. There's no one being abused. And he's looking at God's law, and he's going beyond the rules that condemn him because he has not lived up to them either. And he is seeing in those rules the heart of God. He's seeing God's protection And he cannot help but delight in God's law. He begins to worship God. He says that his law is perfect. Man, if we were to live this out, he says, it would be like a death-to-life experience. It would revive our souls. We would find a human community and a joy in walking in God's commandments that we do not currently experience. He's thinking about all the foolish people that he knows and all the foolish choices that he's made. And he's imagining if we just listened to God's rules and weren't like foolish kids who ran out in the street in front of traffic but actually obeyed what God was saying, how it would make simple, that is, foolish people wise. He's seeing that, looked at from an objective perspective, not in our rebellious human nature, that the commandments are pure, that they rejoice the heart, that they enlighten the eyes. He sees that because God is the supreme ruler of the universe, that it makes sense for us to fear him. That is not cower away from him, but to show him proper respect by doing what he says. And then he says something crazy to our ears. He says that the commandments of God, his laws, are more to be desired than gold. Now think about this. If you could choose between always obeying God's law And being the richest person in history, which would you choose? I think if we gave that some thought for just a few minutes, we would realize the insanity of choosing riches. Because what we really want is a life of purpose, a life that matters. When our heads hit the pillow at night, what we really want is to love God and to love our neighbor as ourself. We understand that that is the rich life. And David is saying, that's what I want. That's what I see in God's law. And he goes on. He can't describe it just as riches. He also describes it as sweet. He says the law is like drippings from the honeycomb. We've all experienced this when we want to do one thing and we, instead of tapping into our selfish desire, we tap into the greater desire to love the people around us and we do what's right and we experience a reward from following the deeper desire that we have to love others. And it is like eating honey in comparison to eating something bitter, because we've made the selfish choice, and maybe it's felt good in the moment, but later on, there's guilt and there's shame associated with that. And David is saying, 
God is brilliant to give us these rules, to give us these laws. Why don't we follow after him when we know it would be good? You know, I found about myself, I don't know about you, but I am totally a rebel at heart. And one of the ways that this has shown up in my life is in the area of school. So some of you are not like this at all, but some of you are, so this is for you. But I remember in school when my teachers would tell me to read this book or do this assignment, my immediate reaction was, how can I do anything but that? Like, it didn't even occur to me, especially in high school, that if I got an assigned reading, that I would actually do that reading. I was like, how do I take the shortest route possible? So I remember in college, this is true, this is so embarrassing. I was probably a sophomore or junior in college. For the first time in my life, the teacher told me to read something, and I did it. I just read the book. And I remember one of my buddies was in my class, and I got an A on this test. And he's like, wow, you got an A on the test. That's so awesome. I was like, yeah. Do you know what my secret was? I hid all of the answers inside my head by doing the assigned reading <laughs> that the teacher gave me. And, and it really was an epiphany for me. It was like, wow. It was a lot easier to just do what they said than to not do what they said. And I think David is, is calling us into that kind of sanity. We're just saying, listen, we spend so much time trying to figure out a different way to be happy. What if your creator knew better than you did? For how to live. What if God, I mean, this is, this is like mind-blowing stuff right here, is smarter than you? <laughs> and his way actually is perfect. And maybe if you look at it and examine it, you don't even need to like write a journal entry, but you just like look at your past history. Like how good have you been at making yourself happy? And so David is saying, listen. When you sit down and think about it, you look into God's law, maybe the least likely place that you would think to find his glory. What you see is his brilliance on display. And you see that if you were to just follow his commands, you would find a delight that is not currently present in your life. Okay, so we see that God's world and God's word reveal the heart of God. And so that's the conclusion that David brings us to. He brings us to the very heart of God. So here's his reflection. He's looked up at the heavens. He's looked at the law of God. And starting in verse 12, he says this, who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So he sees the brilliance, the heaviness, the weightiness, the glory of God. He sees that God wants him to delight. He sees that God has his best intention at heart. And he recognizes something devious about himself. Not only is he constantly committing errors... He can't even discern his errors. Isn't that true of all of us? We are a mystery even to ourselves. Why do I do what I do? 
why do I keep making the same bad choices over and over again? I don't even understand myself. But here's what David doesn't do that many of us do, especially those of us who grew up in the church. He doesn't start condemning himself. He doesn't turn on himself. Man, I am such an idiot. Man, I might as well just give up. It's not even worth trying. He sees that God's brilliance and God's holiness also makes him the most accessible and kind person in the universe. And so he says to God, I can't discern my errors. You can. Here's what I'm asking you to do, God. Declare me innocent. Even though I'm guilty, declare me innocent. Also, God, here's what I need you to do. I recognize that in my own self, I am not capable of keeping myself back from future sin. Even though I've seen this glory, even though I've been to this great worship service, I know myself well enough to know I'm going to go out and I'm going to keep living the exact same way unless you continue to intervene in my life. And so he says, keep me back from presumptuous sins. And he says, then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Then notice, he doesn't promise to God, I'm going to let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. It's a prayer. He's saying, listen, here's my conclusion. If you can create the stars and you can make a brilliant and perfect law, then maybe you could reform my heart. I can't do it, but you could. Maybe you could take out this heart of stone and put in a heart that beats for you, that loves you, that wants to follow you. And so he's saying, not just the words of my mouth, but the meditations of my heart could be pleasing in your sight if you would do this inner transformation in my life. And then he lets us in on his worldview. He believes that God is his Lord, his rock, and his redeemer. Did you know that every time you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, in the Bible, it is referring to God's special name. It means simply Jehovah, which means the existing one. God's name is the one who always has been, the uncreated creator of the universe. And because everything came from him, anything is possible for him. David is recognizing it is impossible for him to reform himself, but because of the person he is talking to, it is possible for God to change the orientation of his heart. So he's saying, you're the Lord. Okay, it's commonly recognized that God is the rock. That is He is faithful, he is unchanging, he is immovable, he is the same. But many of us stop there. We understand that God is holy, he's in a category by himself, he doesn't change. But we think of his holiness as his distance from us. And so at that point, we sort of throw in the towel and say, okay, I recognize that you are brilliant, but your brilliance seems to make you inaccessible to me. Which is why it's so important that David puts in this third word. He says, I don't just believe that you are my Lord and my rock, but you are my redeemer. 
See how personal he is with God? This is the Old Testament. This is before Jesus even came. And this man has the audacity to believe that God is his redeemer. A redeemer is someone who compensates for the poor performance of someone else. He believes that God has such exemplary character that he doesn't condemn us in our mediocrity and our error-filled lives, but that it is his heart to compensate for us in our poor performance. He can redeem our lives, our real lives, our messy lives where we get self-focused and we lose perspective and we sin in real ways that we could never imagine were possible. He compensates for your life right now as you sit in your chair and you feel guilt. He's the Redeemer. His glory as creator and lawgiver are informed by his heart as father. That's the good news of the gospel. The creator of the ends of the earth, who is also judge, is your dad. Here's how I try to compensate for the poor performance of my kids. One of the ways this shows up is I've got a kid who's starting to mow the lawn. All right? Doesn't do a good job. Let's just be honest. He's 11. All right? So here's what happens. I'll come home from work. And the lawn has been mowed. But I immediately notice that there are large swaths of the lawn that are not mowed. And so here's what I do. I go to the garage. I get out the lawn mower. And I go mow the rest of the lawn that was supposedly mowed but has not really been mowed. And then I go inside and I say to this kid, thank you so much for mowing the lawn. That meant so much to me. You did such a good job. I love you. That's so awesome. Why? Because my heart towards my son is as his father. Now, do you think I would treat the guy from the lawn mowing company that way? No. I'd be like, bro, get back out here. And finish mowing the lawn because that's a transactional relationship. But my relationship with my 11-year-old son is different than that. And so I compensate for his poor performance. And David recognizes that that is God's heart toward us. Now he understood in his Old Testament limited perspective of redemptive history that God was his redeemer we understand sitting in this room this morning how God is our redeemer look with me at Ephesians 1 verse 7 it'll be on the screens in Jesus we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace I've got good news for you. You have access to God to see him in all of his brilliance and glory and not to run from him as you look up at the stars or you look into the brilliance of his law because all of your sin has been covered by Jesus. There is not a single sin of a believer in Jesus that is not soaked with his blood. And so you are forgiven. You're free. You have been redeemed. And so, God is a God of grace. And so he is inviting us to delight in him because our fear of punishment is gone because of what Jesus has done, not because of our good performance. So let's rejoice in that together. Jesus, thank you 
that we know that our Redeemer lives. That you spilled your blood for us. That we have access to our Father in heaven. That he is not just creator and good king and good judge, but he is our dad. And thank you that your heart for us is to compensate for our weaknesses, not to condemn us for them. So I ask today that we would be able to delight in who you are. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to spend the rest of our time together in worship. And one of the things I love about Psalm 19 is I feel like we get a really sweet view into the posture of David as he writes. He just, he has this sense of awe and wonder and delight in what God has done for him and all all who he is. So as we sing these songs, I think these songs have that similar posture. So would we bring our hearts before the Lord in a similar manner to what David is in Psalm 19. So would you stand as we sing?
guys, sometimes it can be really unnatural to see a law as being good, um, to see it being sweeter than honey on a honeycomb. But you know what's not hard to see is being out on a lake in Minnesota in 75 degree weather on Memorial Day, or maybe you're on your deck this week, and to look out and experience God's goodness in creation and be reminded that the Monet of this earth is the Monet who has given us words to live by in his law and that we can trust that. And so the application is super simple. Get outside over Memorial Day weekend, see and taste the goodness of God and recognize that that same God is accessible to you. You can know the Monet of this earth and he's actually got words for you and plan for you and he wants to know you. And so experience God this week, have joy in him. You guys are loved. Have a good week.